an awful thing you did to them. And I just thought you should be somewhere safe when you found out. He's going to be released. Can you speak a bit French? No, but we can. Je suis touriste. Je suis. Je suis touriste. Je suis touriste. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> what? 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 what Jambon and uh, fromage. Two, three. Bienvenue sur Clap Point Ciach. Making Blair and Blue Ruin. And I'm Jeremy Sonier, director of Blue Ruin. It certainly was not easy to put together, but uh, as far as the creative side, I had been, uh, I made a film back in 2007. It was a horror comedy. Um, kind of a low-brow, sleazy movie, and it didn't get me much work. It was, it was a modest success on the festival circuit and the guide distribution, and I had since gone back to commercial work, and then I wanted to get back into movies, so I started as a cameraman from the very beginning, and worked my way up doing uh, as a cinematographer, and was watching and waiting and learning and seeing you know, what, was, what was wrong with the, the model in the States, because every, every film seemed like every director that I worked for was just getting their visions trounced and destroyed. And it was never enough time to do good work. You could, you could get the right cast together, you could get the right crew, but then you'd have to just burn through everything and just spit out a movie. And it was never like, you could never actually craft a scene or, 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 or take the time to say, you know, something's wrong here, let's fix it. It was just about making the schedule. So I designed this movie from the very beginning to, to be, a, a showcase of what I had at my disposal and I, I, I had confidence in myself as a director but no one else did rightfully so because my last film had no heat um, when I sent the script out it uh, people got excited about it but then like who's who's directing it Jeremy Sonia who's the star Megan Blair there's no interest because we have we have no like inherent value other than our you know our collaboration so basically we took it out to try and get a million dollars to make it um, and and got encouraging words but no money and I had a third child on the way and I knew that you know daddy can no longer risk every dollar he has on movies going forward so the window was closing summer of 2012 was it if I don't make a movie I probably will never be a director so that was an easy you know motivator and my wife and I uh, cashed in our retirement accounts and every every cent we had and we had our American Express card ready to go but there's a few things that we couldn't we couldn't barter for or put on a credit card and that was crew payroll so for, for that we had to go to Kickstarter and it was a relatively small amount of the budget but a very necessary cash infusion and we raised thirty seven thousand dollars which is less than ten percent of the budget but with that cash coming into our account, we could greenlight the movie and make it happen. And so everything else was designed around safe resources where I wasn't going to cast a, a famous actor that would, would feign interest in the movie, then come on set and then not want to be there, um, not be invested in the project or have some sort of mutiny. I, I knew like I had to enlist my, my, my best friend and one of the most talented actors I've ever seen but never fully, never fully realized or utilized. And so I had him as an asset. I felt I was an asset, but I knew to investors that we were actually, you know, liabilities. Um, so we kind of reversed that, and I insisted on 30 shoot days, which in you know the American indie film model is a luxurious schedule. It's almost always 18. And as a cameraman as well, I, I could, I could, I could really pre-visualize the film, having, you know, I wrote it, directed it, and shot it and knew it could be super efficient and, and do, um, do a film that was more traditionally artfully crafted than your you know, sort of talky US indie. Worked out pretty well, I think. I think so, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. <laughs> yeah, look, the Coens are a huge influence on both of us, I mean, for me, I mean, they're, they're master craftsmen. He had pitched 
the movie to potential investors as wanting to be similar to, maybe not in story, but in tone to, it was like No Country for Old Men, but the, the lead is an idiot. And so that was sort of the <laughs> concept. We, um, we, we had been talking about it for a long time uh, before, we, before we actually shot. And so we had had the benefit of having a lot of time where we could have a lot of really exhaustive conversations about every little nuance and moment in the script so we, we, we kind of knew exactly what we were trying to do and and like I was saying at the beginning I was a little hesitant about like well, the, the choices he was making and then and Jeremy could kind of talk me through every kind of beat so it would so it would make sense so in in, in that sense I don't know if it, you would call it research but it was certainly preparation was just all the, the the talking about the character in the movie that we got to do for like a year ahead of then um, and then, you know, certainly in, in New York, you know, we've done work with, uh, you know, various sort of homeless outreach organizations, and there's people that you meet there, that there was certain elements of personalities of people that I'd met there that I kind of thought were interesting and wanted to absorb as part of Dwight, but mainly it was talking with Jeremy. He had a very articulated, clear vision of what he was trying to get from early on. I could kind of go to him ask questions and get an answer. So. M Macon's very kind at heart, so he, he would have some issues with um, what Dwight would do. But I, you know, I, there's a very brutal side of me that, I, you know, I, I, with vengeance in me, so it's very easy for me to relate to that. So <laughs> I told him, Macon, if someone hurt my family, I would totally try to kill them. It's okay. And, uh, okay. But we did actually, his, his concerns were actually incorporated into the dialogue of there's a big diner scene where his sister, his sister is sort of the voice of reason and of, of the real world. And I'd forgive you if you were crazy. But you're not. You're weak. And, 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 and Dwight is sort of embarking on this mission. And it is very indulgent and, and selfish and violent. But um, I, I incorporated his, his uh, hesitation into her dialogue to sort of make sure that the audience knew that someone would, would be aware of this. I think it was simple things like people don't do this because <laughs> he thinks people don't do this but I do. <laughs> hey. Hey man. If it were my family I might do the same.